Luke 4, 31 through 44. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. Is this the right one? Okay, sorry. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went into every place in the surrounding regions. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill, with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid hands, or he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Uh, C.S. Lewis, um, you might know, he wrote a children's um, series called The Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, and it really is a, a beautiful metaphor of the Christian faith. Uh, in the first book, The Magician's Nephew, C.S. Lewis poetically depicts the scene of creation, and this painting is an attempt to capture that scene. Uh, Jesus is represented by Aslan. He's a lion that you see his silhouette there. Uh, and Jesus' word is represented by Aslan's roaring song. Listen to C.S. Lewis's beautiful writing and gaze on this painting as I read this scene of creation. Okay? In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing the most beautiful noise Diggory had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. Then two wonders happened at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it, but far higher up the scale, cold, tingling, silvery voices. The second wonder was that the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. They didn't come out gently one by one as they do on a summer evening. One moment there had been nothing but darkness. Next moment, a thousand, thousand points of light leaped out. If you had seen and heard it, you would have felt quite certain that it was the stars themselves which were singing. And the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and made them sing. It's beautiful. C.S. Lewis's brilliance, though, even in his brilliant writing, it doesn't do justice to the power of what's represented here, God's words. And we know from passages like Colossians and other places that Jesus himself is the word through which everything was created. So the power of God's word is that he speaks and it is. And so enter Jesus in history and we see God speaking his word again through Jesus. So here's the one thing that I hope will stick with you today, kind of a big point. Jesus' word has power. Jesus and his word, his gospel, it really does speak to everyone and everything. And Jesus' word, it truly is a double-edged sword in that on one hand, it certainly comforts, but it also corrects. Jesus' word, it sets free but it also binds. Jesus heals our body and soul, but also cuts our conscience. 
His word reconciles, but also brings to account. It melts hearts, but also convicts of sin. It brings eternal hope, but is not afraid to tell the truth of an eternal despair. And truly, Jesus and his word, his word uh, both the comforting, joyous truth of heaven it preaches, but also the horrific realities of hell. Now, we've been talking about Jesus' signs, and in Acts, it also speaks of his wonders. His signs and wonders go together. I want to argue today that Jesus' word is actually the greatest sign that he's ever displayed of his coming kingdom. And so I hope and pray that the whole point of this is that you would grow in faith and relate to God, the Father, Son, and Spirit by faith. So here's a prayer that I hope something like this will rise up in our hearts. Lord, let your word powerfully preview your kingdom in my life, that I would experience these signs of the kingdom and I would be encouraged by them. So for the rest of our time, I want to ask the question, uh, how does Jesus' powerful word signal his coming kingdom? I want to draw out just four things today. There's so much more. I actually had six, but whittled it down to four because of time. And I want to show you that Jesus' word has power over the spiritual realm and Satan. Jesus' word has power over science and sickness. And Jesus' word has power because he actually cares. And finally, Jesus' word has power because he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. So let's dive into it. How does Jesus' powerful word signal his coming kingdom? First, Jesus' word has power in the spiritual realm over Satan. Now, earlier, we saw Jesus in the town before. He moved on from Nazareth, his hometown to Capernaum. And in Nazareth, he quotes and reads and preaches from Isaiah 61. And in it, he makes it clear that he's come to proclaim liberty to captives. We know he never literally set someone free like John the Baptist from behind bars. And so what does he mean here? That he's come to set captives free, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And now we begin to see what he means concretely. And so we begin to pick up at verse 33. And in the synagogue, we're going back to, uh, uh, here in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. Now, part of Jesus' narrative, how he looks out on life then, what his reality is, is that there certainly is a spiritual realm. And moreover, as we read the Gospels, Jesus believed in and in fact encountered and confronted demons and even Satan himself. The Bible plainly and simply depicts Satan and demons as fallen angels who work in the world to oppose God to oppress his people, because we know even with believers that Satan could get into their minds and thoughts. Jesus confronted Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, because Satan had put wrongful thoughts in Peter's mind. And certainly Satan works and demons work to blind people spiritually and sometimes even possess unbelievers as we see in the scenes today. But what we see Jesus doing is that he sets these people free from this spiritual captivity. Not only from their sins, but literally here in these situations, demonic oppression, even possession. Now, I get it. Our Western culture is uncomfortable or even mocking of demons. And most of us, when we read these passages about Jesus casting out demons, uh, we say something like this that the gospel writers and Jesus, they were men of their time, and so they were just trying to understand you know, what they saw happening in people's lives as best they could, and so they reduced it to superstitious things like demons and spiritual things like that. Now, we add to that that they didn't understand the signs that we do today, viruses and, you know, the bases for disease and mental health and mental illnesses, and that's why they attributed these things to devils and demons. I appreciate what the late Tim Keller teaches about demons, and, and he says, yes, both the gospel writers and Jesus, they understood that there was paralysis, madness, ailments of a kind that was demonic and a kind that was not, and that meaning they're more sophisticated. Even though it was first century, 
They're more sophisticated than that. They knew that some of these illnesses were caused by the natural and some indeed were spiritual, demonic. So I appreciate what Keller says here, that Jesus Christ, he didn't believe in demons and demon possession out of ignorance, but he believed in it out of conviction. Now what's ironic is that we live in a culture that is open, it allows room for the spiritual, for new age, for soulfulness, getting in touch with you know, deep reflection and, and so forth. We want to be spiritual, but we're unwilling to go the next step of believing that there's a pure, intelligent evil, demons. What's interesting is that we can confidently look at certain people in history, straight in the eye, so to speak, people like the Hitlers and Paul Potts of history, and we know that they are devilish. They're pure evil. But we try to fit evil in a box. We try to just explain it away with our human intellect, our human understanding, be it psychologically, sociologically, or scientifically. Now, I haven't read this book, but someone explained to me that a Jewish thinker, Andrew Del Banco, he's a professor at Columbia, he wrote a book called The Death of Satan. And from his own Jewish heritage, he's thinking about the demonic. And in the book, his main idea is that it's actually tragic in the West that we lose a sense of transcendent evil, that there is something called the demonic. And he uses the Holocaust to prove his point, his thinking of his own mother and father and grandparents that endured that evil. And he says, look, when you think of the Holocaust, we can't just explain away the Holocaust with our human understanding, psychologically, sociologically, scientifically, as evolutionary biology, because you end up either, on one hand, just insultingly trivializing that part in history, or you become really cold. And so let me try to unpack what he means. When it comes to the Holocaust, psychologically, if you're just going to just say that the Nazis just needed a little more tender upbringing, it's because they were so terrible people because they had bad parents. And that becomes very insulting. Sociologically, if you're just going to say that the Holocaust was the result of Northern European racism, that Northern European culture is more racist than other parts of the world, then you begin to dehumanize just like the Nazis did. You're actually doing what the Nazis did and just, just putting, taking whole swaths of people and putting them in one big category. Scientifically, if you're going to say that the Holocaust was just a cold byproduct of evolutionary biology and natural selection and survival of the fittest because that's, if, you, if you're just a truly an evolutionist, that's what you believe, that things like that in history are just natural, just survival of the fittest, just, just the course of nature. And so if you're a true atheist, then are you able to say that? Are you willing to say that, that the Holocaust was just the result of a natural scientific process? So De Banco's point is that if we're honest, our human intelligence lacks the resources to explain some of the real evil that we see in the world. But the Bible, on the other hand, reveals to us that there is an ultimate intelligent designer, namely God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that a part of his creation was the spiritual realm, which included angels, who eventually rebelled, and so there was Satan, the head, the adversary, and his minion demons. And so there is an intelligent evil in this world that opposes God, God's people, and the gospel of grace that would save humans from eternal punishment and opposing it at every turn. The devil, pun intended, is, is hell-bent on destroying Christians and their testimony and stopping the progress of the gospel. So this is why Jesus, as he proclaims his gospel, you see demons being flushed out into the open. And so this demon here, we see that he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? So they're identifying the human, the Son of Man, Jesus of Nazareth, but they know who he is, that he's also truly divine. He's the Holy One of God. 
And so Jesus is like a UV light that reveals the unseen stains and mess that are hard to detect in broad daylight. And so the demon cries out, ha. Now, I believe this is actually misspelled. should be the other way around. It should be, ah, <laughs> because they're fearing. They know who Jesus is. They know their destiny. And they know that he's come to once for all begin that final work of destroying Satan and all that he's incited to rebel against God and leading man in against, uh, rebellion against God. They know that Jesus is not only the Son of Man, but he is the Son of God. And this is why the demon here seeks to broadcast that Jesus is the Son of God. There's actually something devilish here, something conniving. What's the demon's play here? What's his attempt at a tactical, strategic move here? Why would broadcasting that Jesus is the Son of God hamper Jesus' witness at this point? The commentators I read, they all agree, consistent in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels, is Jesus' priority to keep his identity as the Son of God under wraps until a perfect timing. There's a right timing and progression to Jesus being revealed for who he truly is. In part, this was to avoid Jesus' ministry going astray to becoming a mere geopolitical uprising. Because we see as Jesus did his miracles and taught, the crowds grew larger and larger. But Jesus' whole point wasn't for his movement, his ministry to become a political movement, an earthly political movement in that time in history against the Roman government. First century Jews under Roman occupation, they were painfully longing for their Messiah and expected him to be this perfect mix of a powerful military uh, leader combined with a powerful religious ruler. And so this is why we see even the disciples after Jesus' resurrection, before he ascends back to heaven, in Acts chapter 1, they're asking the resurrected Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Before the Holy Spirit was poured out, their understanding was still not perfect. It was limited. And they were envisioning a geopolitical movement. So in the Gospels, we see Jesus progressively revealing his identity to his disciples to the point at a key moment, he asked Peter, who do the people say that I am? And even then, they weren't sure. It wasn't, it wasn't definitive that he's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. But Peter answered, you're the Messiah. Meaning there was a progression. So certainly here, there's, it makes sense that the demons would want people to know this is the Son of God. Meaning if we can get this movement going to take Jesus' ministry and his purpose of being on earth just a little bit astray. Meaning Satan would have been completely fine and in fact tempted Jesus in the wilderness to become a king, a victorious mighty king without going through the path of a suffering servant. But Jesus knew no, his path, is not to be a victorious earthly king at this point in history, but his only crown would be of thorns, and his only elevation would be on a cross to be a suffering servant. So Christ follower, Christian, be encouraged and strengthened. What does Jesus do? He rebukes him with a word, powerful, be silent, and come out of him. So simple, so effective, and the demon can only submit and obey. Well, asking again, how does Jesus' powerful word signal his coming kingdom? Next, I want you to be encouraged that Jesus' word has power over science and sickness. Jesus' authority is not only over the spiritual and Satan, and it's, it's appropriate that Luke, Dr. Luke, who wrote this gospel, being the beloved doctor that he is, he records in the next scene, we'll see Jesus having authority over even fevers, viruses. Now remember, Jesus, his ministry, it was three-pronged. The main purpose 
was to proclaim, to preach, to announce that God's kingdom, Jesus' kingdom is near, and that we're to repent and adjust our attitudes and really turn to God. And then the other two prongs, it seems they were pretty equal in, in priority, was to set people free spiritual, spiritually, meaning from demons, their spiritual captivity, and to heal people physically. And we see in this next scene a beautiful picture of that. And so, picking up verse 38, he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house, Peter's house. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, sorry. Skipped ahead. And they appealed to him on her behalf, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now later, Luke records in his second volume in Acts, he explains that men of Israel, this is Peter preaching, Luke records this, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, that man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. So there it is. That explains why Jesus did these miracles, because they were signs pointing to who he truly is, that he's a fulfillment of prophecies like Isaiah 61, and that he's pointing to God's future kingdom. So this is why Jesus does miracles. This is why he heals people. Because Jesus' miracles are wonders that serve as signs that he is indeed the Messiah and signs of his future new world. So when we see the physically blind healed, the lame healed, when Peter's mother-in-law is healed of flu-like symptoms, when they're given sight, this is a powerful, wonderful sign and foretaste that one day we will all have perfectly restored, disease-free, ageless, resurrected new bodies. Now, we look out just on, you know, us as humans, and each year there are many annual conferences and conventions where the future is on display. Take, for example, CES the Consumer Electronics Show, a highly sought-after stage for tech companies to show off what's on the pipeline and software solutions. And it's four days of a glimpse into the technological future, and there are a lot of oohs and ahs. Jesus is doing something similar here, but with infinitely more consequence. He's giving us a glimpse into his final narrative, his final story. It speaks to Jesus' final vision for our bodies, our souls, our relationships, our sexuality, our work, our politics, our health, our recreation, our glory, God's glory, our right standing with God, and indeed, our truest eternal happiness. And we're to see Jesus' powerful word, just a simple, powerful word that commands authority over these things and speaks it into being. What's beautiful here is that when Jesus rebuked, we saw it earlier in the slide, the, the slide before, when he rebuked the fever, it's beautiful to know that the exact same word in Greek that was used when Jesus rebuked the demon is used here to rebuke the sickness. Jesus has full authority over physical and spiritual forces. Now, I know what some of us are already thinking and perhaps asking in our hearts. And so I want to try to help us receive the full comfort from Jesus' power and authority over sickness because I know some of us are feeling and thinking, if not now or at certain points in our lives, Lord, please heal me. Lord, why aren't you healing me? I'm asking you to heal me. Why aren't you healing me? So here's what we have to remember. Even these people who were healed miraculously, like Peter's mother-in-law, it was just temporary. And eventually, they passed away. Albeit, they passed away a little bit more physically restored. But the whole point of these signs and wonders, is just, it's just a temporary sign. Jesus just previewing what we can look forward to. Certainly where he healed certain people, it's a blessing. It's an amazing blessing to experience. And if that's God's will, 
that you be healed from something miraculously while you're on this earth. Praise God. I believe he still does it. I've witnessed it with my own eyes. But it's not the norm. And even then, the purpose is somehow for that person to be encouraged and their testimony to be a sign to convince more and more people of that eternal hope. On the street where I live, our street is facing a tragedy right now because my next door neighbor, an elderly couple in their 70s, their adult son, who was only 43 years young, he lives with them and he was just innocently picking a pimple just a few weeks ago. He broke the skin and against all odds, a germ got into his bloodstream and this germ ended up being a flesh-eating bacteria. And tragically, through a series of complications, we just got the news yesterday that he went into cardiac arrest, only to be resuscitated after too long, resulting in permanent irreparable brain damage. And now as parents, they're faced with a decision no parent should have to face while on this earth, whether to keep their child on the breathing machine or not. Now, the one silver lining in all this is that they are believers. They're a believing family. So these kinds of situations, they force us to reckon, would I rather be healthy and happy, have my little slice of health and happiness temporarily for now, but at the cost of a miserable eternity? So even as Christians, we can become childish, say, Lord, Why won't you heal me? And we lose eternal perspective. Or is there happiness that can last forever after this life, a health that will last forever after this life, even if in this life I face my share of pain and suffering? So this is why we need to ask again, how does Jesus' powerful word signal his coming kingdom? And Jesus' word has power because he truly cares. One of the most important comforts when we suffer, if you're like me, is to know, see, feel, hear, and experience someone who truly cares and compassionately stays by your side as you suffer. This is Jesus to perfection. And we see it in profound ways in today's passage. Going back to verse 33, where we began in, in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And so I want you to notice the detail. And in the synagogue, there was a man. Just think of synagogue as church. It was Sabbath worship. They were at church. And what should give us pause here is that, first of all, Satan One of his demons took over man and took him to church. (laughs) This challenges our pastoral heart for people. And here, it's a beautiful scene. You got to see this as Jesus caring. He's okay with messiness at church. Jesus could have done something to just quiet that person and not have this chaos come out in church, at service, no less. Jesus is not perturbed or annoyed to have this messy situation arise, this demon-oppressed situation surface. And he allows the real situation, the real burden, the real pain, the real torment to come to the surface in the view of everyone. And Jesus deals with it as only he can. My humble 24 years of of pastoral ministry, in my observation, the greatest complaint that I've seen against church and Christians that I've personally observed from people, non-Christians who visit a church or even Christians who've been come to church and feel frustrated or hurt, it's that church, sometimes you you come and you feel like, maybe unintentionally even, that you have to have it all together. (laughs) In church culture and history, we come in our Sunday best, and, and maybe unwittingly we give off this vibe that you got to have it all together. But that's not what we see in this scene. 
Thankfully, Jesus could not be more diametrically opposite. And we see it again beautifully, jumping to verse 40. He's in Capernaum. Sabbath worship is finished. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. What's going on here? When Luke records that the sun was setting, he's saying the Sabbath was coming to an end because the day ended with the sunset. It was the end of the Sabbath. And we know that Jesus, he was more than happy to heal on the Sabbath because he just did at the synagogue and at Peter's home and in other places. And he got in trouble for that. And he healed on the Sabbath because the physical healing and the demonic you know, just the casting out of the demon and the spiritual freedom was a manifestation of the true meaning and picture of God's Sabbath, his final rest that would come through Christ. But sadly, the people didn't know. And what can't be lost on us is that as faithful, dutiful Jews, this group, this crowd was waiting, waiting at a safe distance away from Jesus for the Sabbath to be over before they would do the work of walking and carrying their beloved sick ones to Jesus. According to the tradition of the scribes and Pharisees, Jews could not carry a burden or travel more than about one kilometer on the Sabbath. Only after sundown did they feel allowed and guilt-free to carry their sick to Jesus. And their eagerness is seen in the fact that they waited for the sun to set. So can you imagine a great crowd of people psychologically and guiltily waiting, keeping their safe distance from Jesus because they were afraid to break Sabbath rules. All the while, they're readying their sick loved ones. It's actually a scene to be pitied. Can you imagine it? You're the one trying to bring your your sick loved one. Don't worry. The Sabbath is almost over. I'll get you there. I hear that he heals people. I know it's getting dark. Don't worry, I'll protect you. We'll be okay. We're in a big crowd. (laughs) And as soon as they were free to travel, the multitudes came. And what does Jesus do? Knowing they are wrongfully burdened by a false understanding of the Lord's Sabbath, he compassionately waits. He sticks around until sundown. And he laid hands on every single sick person that day. Look, just confession of my human weakness. When my appointment doesn't show up after 15 minutes, I send a polite text saying, let's reschedule. And I move on (laughs) to the rest of my day. But not Jesus. He waits full of compassion to heal. I hope you see his tender care here. Truly, what a savior. And so as the saying goes, the pithy saying goes, people don't care about what you have to say until they know you truly care. Jesus is the paragon, the best example of that. Trinity Grace, I pray that our church our new community groups, that our fellowship, even Sunday services could be a genuinely safe place of grace where people can come with all their demons, literally, with all their wounds and hurts. That people could be set free in our fellowship and find healing in Jesus' powerful word even as we learn to minister and apply Jesus' word and him and his grace to one another. So let me end with, um, hopefully, it, it, some helpful, practical ways to respond to this. And so just asking one last time, how does Jesus' powerful word signal his coming kingdom? Jesus' word has power because he is the Christ. Okay, He is the Messiah, the Son of God. How do we see today's scene ending? And the demons also came out of many after sunset, crying, you are the son of God. 
But again, Jesus rebuked them and he would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. It wasn't the timing. Pastor Tabidi uh, Anyobile reflects more beautifully than I can on this passage. So I'll just read his thoughts and his call to action. So first to friends who don't believe yet. Beloved, do not let demons that cannot be saved acknowledge more about Jesus than you whom he came to save. Demons have enough sense to ask, have you come to destroy us? The demons knew he could. Their only concern was when. They did not assume they had unlimited time to carry on their wickedness. They knew their days were numbered. So also the days of man's sinful rebellion are numbered too. You'll either end your rebellion by repenting now of your sin, confessing it to God, and asking for forgiveness through Jesus Christ, or Jesus will end your rebellion by demonstrating his holiness in eternal condemnation on that judgment day. So friend, don't sit here in your sins and fail to ask the Lord, will you destroy me because of my sin? The wise man repents. The wise man returns to Jesus. The wise man recognizes that Jesus is the Son of God, the chosen one of God. So be wise. Recognize Jesus. Come to him while you can be saved. To Christians, the response of these demons, ironically, has much to teach us. Look how loudly they proclaim that Jesus is the Holy One of God and the Son of God. With a loud voice and shouting, they proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. That's how demons acknowledge Jesus. Do we acknowledge Jesus as loudly? Or are we in some measure ashamed to proclaim Christ more boldly than we do now? And if we are ashamed of Jesus before men, Jesus teaches in Luke chapter 9 that he'll be ashamed of us before his Father in heaven. And so Christian, consider how the demons obey Jesus. Are we quicker and more joyful in our obedience to Jesus than the demons are? They obey him because he exercises raw authority toward them, and they have to submit. But towards us, he shows love. How much more should we, who have been loved by God through Jesus, his son, show our love toward him in a quick, glad, and full obedience? Let's pray. Lord, let your word powerfully preview your kingdom in our lives. Lord, help us to take a hold of the joy and benefit of beginning to experience previews and foretastes. We thank you that your word is powerful over Satan. Lord, I pray for any of us who feel oppressed, that as we turn to you, you'd be so kind and good. You're the same Jesus in these words 2,000 years ago as you are today. And so rebuke any dark forces and presence in our lives. As parents pray for children, whether young or old, would you hear their cries calling on your name, that you rebuke any dark presence in those lives. Lord, we thank you that you ultimately have power over our health, our sickness, over science. And we know your wisdom is higher than ours. Lord, if we're honest, of course, we would just love to be healed of everything here and now. But help us to find real true hope in the new creation. And that it would carry us and help us be good witnesses until you call us home. And Lord, help us, maybe even most importantly, to Remember, you truly care. You truly care. Help us to stay near the cross, as we sang earlier, and to find real comfort in you all our days and every moment. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.